الرحمن الرحيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله With Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, I give open and sound testimony that there is none worthy of worship except Allah and Allah alone. And I give open and sound testimony that Prophet Muhammad is indeed the messenger of Allah. I greet you, our audience, this evening with the greeting of peace. As-salamu alaykum. Tonight we're going to have an open and frank discussion about a very essential movement and a narrative that is taking place in America. In the backdrop of many incidents that are taking place globally and nationally among people finding, trying to find identity, trying to find relief, trying to find relationships, trying to be culturally competent, as well as those who are a major part of society today, and that is the faith community. The faith community has a, an extremely large and important role to play in any society and in all times. But sometimes that faith community can find itself divided against itself until someone has the courage to step outside of the ring, step outside of the box, if you will, come out of the dark and into the light and open up a conversation and have a dialogue. Tonight we're going to talk about the forerunner who has started this dialogue and where that dialogue is today. We have with us some very experienced <clears throat> men, men of knowledge, men of faith, men who have traveled around the world, men who have interacted and intersected with societies and peoples from all around the world. We're going to talk about the interfaith movement here in America what it has produced, what we hope it to produce, and where are we going from here. To my immediate right, we have Imam Rakib Abdul Jabbar. And to his right, we have Imam Antar, Antar Jana. And to his right, we have Imam Abu Qadir El Amin. My brothers, I greet you in the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When we talk about the interfaith movement. We know that in our book, the Quran, and that we are all Muslim, God lets us know that we are to respect his books and to respect his people. And that there is a kinship among the people, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and all people of goodwill and faith. But the Abrahamic faith community has a specific and a unique bond within itself. And we know that for many years, if we kind of wind the clock back a few years, go back, back, back into time just a little bit, then we'll race forward. There was a time when the largest identifiable Muslim community in America was a community that spoke rather harshly, I would say at times, about uh, its brethren and cousins in the faith community. And there was a reason for that. There was a context for the narrative. But God in his wisdom, grace and mercy, saw fit to have that community, which was then the nation of Islam, transition from its developmental stages into, I would say, an expedited entry into a global thinking and a re reconciliation of thought to become an active community and a leading community in reconciling not only its own thought, but reconciling its relationship with others, the people of the book. And the forerunner and leader of that movement was the late Imam Warathuddin Muhammad. May Allah be pleased with him. I would like to start with you, Imam Abu Qadir El Amin. If you would give us the listening audience or the viewing audience some insight and try to keep it uh, you know, a little briefer than my introduction. Yes. Into yes. Uh, your experience with that movement yes. and how you see the interfaith movement today. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, to give a little background, I'm not. I'm gonna try to be as brief as I possibly can and be as thorough as I can. Uh, at about 14 years of age, uh, my older brother was involved with the <clears throat> Nation of Islam and began to bring home literature newspapers, books, things of that nature. 
and uh, many of my peers uh, became members of the Nation of Islam. So at about 14 years old, I began to be influenced by the language of the Nation of Islam and the narrative of the Nation of Islam as it existed at that time. Then at about 17 years old, I began to claim Islam. And at 19 years old, I made a serious commitment to follow Islam. At 20 years old, I began to practice Islam. So coming out of the Nation of Islam, we were characterized as a baby nation. And looking back on that, you know, we know the life of babies. And the life of babies, sometimes babies cry a lot, holler a lot when they're uncomfortable. But that same baby that used to cry a lot, lot and holler about the discomforts and holler when it was hungry and holler when it was in pain uh, has evolved. And now is, a, 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 I would say, a young adult, no longer a teenager. There's been some years that have passed. We've evolved. We've grown in our intellect and our understanding of our faith. And we are no longer constrained by the structures of what was that baby nation. And uh, we have been involved with interfaith at the direction of Imam W. Dean Muhammad since he stepped into leadership 1975. And so some of us came from households and families that didn't necessarily accept Islam. So we have a sensitivities for Christians and we understand the life of Christians. Many of us came from that background. So for us, interfaith was natural. We were already involved in interfaith activity, if not necessarily dialogue, with our family members. But now it's more pronounced, it's more deliberate, and we have established purposely relationships with Christians and Jews in our locales to further the understanding and look for opportunities for cooperation and uh, not just dialogue, but working together on common concerns. Uh, Imam Antar Jana. I remember at a point in our development when there was a movement, and that movement uh, was the movement to remove all racial images that attempt to, to portray the divine. And I remember that you were very active in the, and enthusiastic in that movement. Uh, that movement seemed to have been, from my perspective, uh, the movement that uh, I would say heralded in uh, many good works as we targeted the, the Vatican with uh, Imam Warthi Muhammad was uh, introduced to the Vatican and great works came out of that and great works came out of and results out of the work that you were leading uh, in that particular movement at the time. How do you see the development of the interfaith narrative, the development of the interfaith work as Imam uh, Al Amin has uh, addressed and where do you see that work giving fruit today? Mm, uh, good question. Um, but to, 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 just to talk about Crate, uh, Imam uh, Muhammad brought in this committee uh, in 1978, 79, and um, when he moved to Oakland and became the resident imam here, he made me the, I was the resident imam, I'm a resident Crate chairman of Oakland, and he made me the national Crate chairman. And so, um, and he moved here. At, and when he moved here, we were very active. We would visit the pastors and, 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 and give them 90 days. We were talking about idol, uh, idol, idol worship and the removal of statues and pictures from the churches. And so they, I thought I was called like the, the calling card of the prophets. It, 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 Imam Muhammad was letting them know, he, even though he was a Muslim, he was concerned with the Christian church. And so we would uh, give them opportunity to take them down. If they didn't in 90 days, we would picket their churches. So we were picketing churches, nonviolent protests. We were picketing churches all over the Bay Area, Richmond, uh, East Palo Alto, San Francisco, Oakland. And, and uh, just as a short story, the, the, the Preacher's Union was very upset about that. It was kind of bad for business. <laughs> and so uh, uh, they, they delegated one of their representatives, a, a Reverend Thrower, right. uh, to meet with Imam Muhammad. And so we went to Imam, uh, Reverend Thrower's church, and he said he felt like Pontius Pilate meeting with Jesus. <laughs> and he, uh, he complimented Imam, he gave a nice presentation. And uh, then the imam gave a presentation, and uh, he told, the imam told him that we would no longer pick at the churches anymore because he just wanted to put something on their mind just to, to educate them. And uh, I think that was monumental because we, we sent the word out all around the country to let them know what had happened in Oakland 
and then everybody stopped, you know. Mm -hmm. And the man was just trying to let the Christian, that was, that was interfaith to me at, at its highest level. He was letting the Christian community know that Exodus 20 verses 1 and 5 said there should be no graven images in, in, uh, in religion. And, um, and he was just there to, you know, to educate them because they were there. Yeah. They were there. Yeah. And he was suggesting that they take it, take it, take it down. And, and, I, and to, to see the interaction between uh, Imam and Reverend Thor that day, to me, that was the first opportunity I had to see a, a, a prominent pastor representing the priesthood duty and Imam Martha de Muhammad, a national leader, have dialogue about you know, this uh, element that was in Christianity that needed to be removed. And Imam was in the forefront, like you say, he was in the forefront of making that happen. Not just in the United States, but it went all the way to the Vatican. You know, it, it was a national petition drive to have a dialogue between Imam Muhammad and Pope John Paul II, and, and so the Vatican got uh, started a good understanding of the Imam, and I think that that, like I said, was the uh, highlight of interfaith dialogue for me to see that happen. Well, you know, sometimes when we we uh, correct a situation, the correction is sometimes taken as an offense or as an affront. Uh, what? do you perceive to be the damage or the harm that the imam, other than in the church itself, uh, what psychological damages or community-wide damages do you think was trying to be uh, brought to the table? This was the imam's main concern, that Caucasians worshiping under a picture of a Caucasian man that they say is God but it causes a superiority complex in them. And it, and it causes uh, the opposite in African Americans. They have this inferiority complex. So subsequently, they would perform well, really well in a society with, the, with these images. So the Imam take them down, you know, remove them because they're not supposed to be there anyway. In 1980, the Black Psychologists Association passed a bill, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bearing witness to what Imam Muhammad said was true, that they should uh, take the images down because subliminally, you know, subconscious manipulation. Mm -hmm. That subliminally people were getting inferiority and superiority complexes. And so the imam said this was a solution for racism. You know, take the, that's like one, one, one element, take the picture down. Absolutely, very beautiful, very beautiful. Well, that shows the, the impact of the faith community being loyal to the core of faith, that there's one God, and whether you're of faith or not, the works of the faith community will have an impact on you. Yes. yes. And it had an impact on society. Yes. Very, very good. Imam. Rakib Abdul Jabbar. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi I just met you recently. Just met you last night, as a matter of yeah, fact. Had some like nice tea, right? Thank you very yeah, much yeah, for yeah, the nice tea. And I'd like to thank you very much for that uh, nice suit that you Ma made for me. Ma Ma I'm sorry that I'm, if I'm teasing the audience. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they missed out. It's <laughs> they all right. They missed, they missed out. They missed out. They missed Absolutely. Out. Uh, Imam, in the interfaith movement, I know you travel mm. nationally, mm. internationally. Mm. You've been to many countries, and you've done a lot of work. Uh, in, the, in the world of chaplaincy mm. uh, across the board. How do you perceive dialogue and do you see the benefit or is there a harm that you may perceive in dialogue with others outside of the Islamic faith and how do you perceive that that dialogue should proceed or not? Mm. Um, Bismillah. I, the dialogue, I see a benefit in the dialogue. It's just like Imam Alameen said, for us being raised as Muslims in this country, um, being of descent of Africans, uh, either we came into Islam with Christian parents, mm -hmm. or one of our parents was influenced either by the movement in the 60s, either by the nation or even by Malcolm. Um, like my grandfather uh, was a Gaviite, and when uh, my father came of age, um, he came into the nation and, and followed Malcolm. So when he introduced Islam to our family, my mother never became Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother is still alive today. My mother is 88. My father is 91. Um, and my mother is a Catholic. So that, for us, interfaith is natural. You know, we, we don't have those predisposed attitudes that of trying to convince or beat someone over the head mm -hmm. to come to our way. What I have found in my travels with the interfaith is that 
with that context, we approach it from a non-apologetic standpoint. Mm -hmm. We have nothing to apologize about being Muslim. It's right. nothing that we have to convince people of, um, like our brothers that come across the, from across the water. So um, being a chaplain uh, in the prison system or in the hospital um, is very easy. It's more harder for them to accept us that we can accept them than it is for us to, uh, for them to believe that we can automatically accept them on the standpoint of where they're coming from and just have a dialogue. I, I, the most enjoyment that I have working as a chaplain is in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because death has no race and it has no religion. Yeah. So when death comes to a person in the hospital, uh, you'd be surprised how many people don't have anyone to talk to yeah. mm -hmm. or don't have family that's coming to visit them. Right. So in the hospital, people want to talk. Mm -hmm. They got a lot to get off because being in the bed, being sick, you know, you some kind of way you're trying to get right with your creator. Mm -hmm. And um, I did my um, uh, CPE in a Catholic hospital, come to think of it, and I was the first Muslim chaplain that they ever had an African-American Muslim at that. So, and it was an indigenous neighborhood, but they were very surprised that I was astute to their book, mm -hmm. as well as being able to talk to them just about life. So um, I think that interfaith dialogue, I, I think we actually we need to find another word for maybe we just need to drop the interfaith and just mm -hmm. call it dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, human dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, because um, faith doesn't play a factor when it comes to dealing with humanity because you're trying to find a base where we are equal at. But if you come in with religion first, we go on. I think Malcolm even said that, right? Well, he said put it in the closet. I don't <laughs> want to put it in the closet, but, you know, we just have to deal with each other on, on a human basis, on a human factor. And then from there we can settle our differences. Okay. Imam uh, Abdul, I mean, uh, Abdul Qadir, following up on that, interfaith is when you're engaging with others of faith, not necessarily of your own particular persuasion. Yeah. That has been effective because everyone not everyone, but many of us realize what we have in common, how much we have in common, and, w and why we should share with our shared values the living space that we're in to try to make life better and different for not only ourselves, but for those who we as a faith community feel that we are charged with aiding, assisting, and improving the conditions thereof. What experience have you had as an imam and you yourself, I know, are world travel, nationally travel, uh, have engaged on many, many levels with many people. What is the condition that you find in the inner faith, the intra-faith, but among Muslims that are, as Imam uh, Abdul-Jabbar pointed out, that come into this environment not having necessarily, some have it, because I've gone into Africa myself and different places where people don't seem to have a problem getting along with each other and accepting mm, that people are mm, okay mm. in their own right with their faith. But yes. some are more polarizing in their view. Yes. And, uh, and maybe even a little bit critical of those of us who would dare engage with those whom they would consider an enemy to us and to our faith and, and definitely to them. What has been your experience and how have you handled that? Uh, or have you had that experience? Y yes, thank you. Yes, I have had that experience. I find that sometimes, and this is not doesn't apply to everyone, but I've encountered individuals who are insecure within themselves. Insecure within and themselves. those people who are insecure with their own faith sometimes mm. see uh, someone else's faith as a threat to a position that they may hold. And in, in cases like that, then it becomes this kind of competition, uh, us versus them kind of mentality. Mm. Uh, and I've, I've had people tell me, why do you do interfaith? They're not going to accept you. 
I said, well, you know, that's your position. That's not my position. My position is we live here together. We share the environment together. We have to establish relationships with one another. And so uh, one, one individual pointed out a verse to me in the Quran that says they're not going to accept you to, until you uh, uh, become like them. I said, well, they won't accept me then. <laughs> 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 but that's not the only thing the book says. So he pointed out that verse, and there, there are many other verses that say that we should have dialogue, we should protect the places of worship of Christians and Jews, and that we should re recognize them as for their sincerity. Uh, we recognize that uh, they we they're, they're governed by a book, we're governed by a book. So you know we have to bring to this our own thinking. Many of them are, are opposed to some ideas because of experience they may have had being under colonial powers. So these are some of the challenges that I've experienced. But I'd like to quote Muhammad Ali, who I saw a video where he was being questioned about his faith, and he was being uh, uh, questioned <coughs> about the differences in religion. And he pointed out, he said, uh, are you familiar with lakes? person said yes. He said, what about streams? He said, yes. He said, what about ponds, yeah, oceans? And then he summed it up, and I'm paraphrasing him. He said, it's all water. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when you, you know, when you think about faith, it's all faith. Mm -hmm. And none of us can speak absolutely. Though we may have absolute conviction, we are not absolute authorities. Mm -hmm. God is going to be the ultimate judge. The creator, Allah, is going to be the ultimate judge, not us. Right. You know, so yeah, when we bring it like that, I think <coughs> it lowers the threshold of uh, people keeping their guards up. Yeah, you know, I'm not trying to train, change Christians, <laughs> except to make them better. Absolutely. And, and the same thing with other people that I encounter, I want to see them to be the best they can be. At the same time, I believe that I have something that contribute to human beings growth, development and enrichment. Amen. And that's Amen. Islam and the Quran and the life of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the great contributions of Muslim leaders, individuals like Imam W.D. Muhammad, mm -hmm. Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. His whole funeral was a, a dawah program. Mm -hmm. His whole janazah, he planned that it would introduce Islam to more people. Mm -hmm. So that's how he lived his life, and that's how he left here. Mm -hmm. that's so that's beautiful. extraordinary. That's yeah. And that's, that's a, uh, an excellent transition. Uh, Imam Antar Jana, you've written books. Uh, one that I, I want to get, I'll talk about that off the air. <laughs> but uh, you wrote a book and you had a program about fathers. Yes. And so uh, the point that, the reason I'm bringing this point up is the knowledge that we have as people that are produced through faith, our knowledge, our base, our foundation is our faith. Can you speak to the benefit of sharing? what your faith has offered, has given to you, sharing that in the, in the shared living space, in the general society, without the requirement of one becoming what you are? I think it, uh, is, 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 Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he said, I, I, the only reason that he came or was sent was that we would have good character. Okay, so like with the Father's Program, we're just talking to men about character, yes. honesty, trustworthiness, integrity, morality, moral consciousness. Yeah. You know, this is cross, again, I guess it's across the board. Across the yeah. board. This is across the board. I can, I can go to any faith right. and talk about these characteristics that should be in a man. Mm -hmm. And so when we start, and then the same thing with nature. If we, if we look at husband, father, mm -hmm. the husbandman, okay, agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, horticulture, you know, the, the dealing with animals, dealing with plants. So if, if you know how to grow plants, if you know how to raise animals, then that's a good prerequisite for raising a family. You know, we've gotten away from that now. You know, we don't, we're in the city now. We don't <laughs> do that. But in the, a long time ago, we were on the farm. We were, we were in nature. Absolutely. And we had a lot more patience. You know, like the prophets, they were all sorry, sorry. sheep herders. Mm. You know, and so it, built, it builds a certain amount of character and caringness and stuff like that. So, Really, we don't have to talk with religious labels to get our point across to make people better. Mm -hmm. You know, we just deal with nature. We can deal with character development because all the all the great spiritual leaders—that's what they were teaching. Mm -hmm. If we just boil it down, you know, take away the labels and 
You know, like what were they teaching? They were teaching people how to be morally conscious people, obedient to the Creator. So I think that you know, the, the, this is this is what makes us uh, that gives us that uh, that uh, extra incentive to be uh, have interfaith that the dialogue, right. because real basically we're the same. Absolutely, that's beautiful. Well, we are coming to the end of this session. Uh, perhaps there'll be a part two, uh, but I think it has been absolutely um, fan fascinating uh, to hear the depth of wisdom that has been uh, exposed to myself and to, to those who are watching this program uh, coming from the three of you. And yet that wisdom is so simple, so available, so commonsensical, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the nuts and bolts of interfaith because you, all three of you gentlemen have brought up uh, the point of really the nucleus of society and that, that being the family, that being the family. And there are some questions that I'm sure comes into the mind of uh, the average person on any given day. One is intermarriage. Uh, because we live in a society, in a community, in societies and in communities where we do have uh, ancestral and historical ties, fam family or familiar ties, and some of those ties have boundaries. That though the ties are there, the relationships may be there, the the uh, association may be there, but there's a mechanics also that is there that requires that those of faith respect those boundaries and respect those mechanics. So on the next portion of this uh, talk uh, this evening, I would like to uh, start off right back with uh, Imam uh, Rahib Abdul-Jabbar and uh, begin that conversation more in depth about the uh, inner workings of families, uh, marriage, inter interfaith marriages, who can marry whom, uh, and we'll just kind of take it from there. Uh, I think we need to uh, kind of move back another veil and uh, peel back another yeah. uh, layer of the onion here. That's a yeah. serious yeah. veil right yes. there, yes. brother. <laughs> so uh, hopefully uh, when we come back, we will be able to do that. So at this point, I'm going to uh, say alhamdulillah, and thank you very much. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, and as God, highly glorified is he, for allowing us this opportunity. And I pray that whatever is being said tonight is of a benefit. And I want our audience to know that Whatever's being said here, if we have offended anyone, it is not deliberately. We are only explaining what we have as men of faith experienced and are willing to share. And if we've said anything wrong that is not valid, it is on us. And we ask God to forgive us, have mercy upon us, and correct our speech, our behavior, and accept our good intentions. So I'll say at this point, peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum. I am Imam Mikhail Shabazz. See you soon.